In this section, we'll move away from discussing the uh, causes of the late 19th century industrial boom and begin looking at some of the problems. First, as implied in the earlier section, the money had become so centralized, with so much money in the hands of a few, that it was impossible for many small businessmen uh, ever have any hope of acquiring much wealth. Uh, they couldn't start their own business in a market that was dominated by a monopoly. Uh, the cost of new technology was beyond their reach, and uh, in an age of laissez-faire, the large companies were free to be ruthless in their anti-competitive strategies. A lack of regulation not only meant monopolies that were anti-competitive, but also corruption and rampant fraud. Uh, just after the Civil War, uh, Ulysses Grant was president from 1868 to 1876, and he'd been a great general in the, in the Civil War, but he was easily taken advantage of. He'd been raised in poverty, and he kind of longed all of his life for the status of being rich, the horses, the whiskey, the fine cigars, and so forth. And when these gifts were given to him, and along with a lot of praise, you know, he didn't understand that they carried with him a price. Uh, you know, the corruption was sort of encouraged politically because after the issue of Reconstruction was settled, there really wasn't that much separating the two parties, and each tried to win support by promising favors, so-called spoiled system. Neither Democrats or Republicans were against big business, although Republicans' record is probably more big business than Democrats as time went on. The U.S. Senate was probably the most corrupt. Unlike today in most states, the senators were elected by state legislatures. There's no popular vote. And, you know, what you end up having was these uh, political machines with a rich boss who usually wouldn't run for office but would use his political support in the state legislators to have someone he wanted elected to the Senate. And that's the senator would do whatever the boss wanted him to do, not what the people cared about. Uh, the result was a bunch of do-nothing senators called us keeping the status quo. Uh, you have a number of examples of this, but probably the one most famous is James G. Blaine, a senator from Maine who, in his 21 years in Congress, never introduced one piece of constructive legislation. One of the earliest scandals during the Grant administration was in late 1869. It became known as the Black Friday Gold Conspiracy. Two speculators, Jim Fisk and Jay Gould, Gould of course been mentioned in regard to the railroads, decided that they were going to uh, corner the market on gold. There was a limited amount of gold, which is the basis of U.S. currency, and they were going to buy it up and sort of hoard it, and uh, that would drive the price up, and then they would dump it all at once and, and reap a huge profit. These two speculators, Fisk and Gould, started buying up the gold on Black Friday when the price became so high that let, let legitimate businessmen, that they, they needed gold in their transactions, but they couldn't get it, and they were driven into bankruptcy. President Grant unwittingly helped the speculators when some of their friends convinced him that if he would stop the U.S. government's treasury from selling gold, uh, he could help inflation and help farmers get more for their wheat. Uh, so when Grant stops uh, releasing the U.S. gold, it was easier for the speculators to control the gold in the market. In the end, Grant finally wised up and began to sell the gold liberally, and this kind of ended the panic. Another scandal was in the fall of 1872 during the Grant administration. People who ran the Union Pacific Railroad Company needed work done on their railroad, and they created their own construction company to do the work. Rather than have competitive bids, uh, they simply granted their, their own construction company all the work at an inflated price, and they pocketed the difference. Uh, the total was over $23 million in work that was billed but never done. Uh, to keep it a secret, they even paid congressmen and journalists and others uh, or gave them credit, you know, mo mobile or stock. We'll probably never know exactly how many people were involved. They uh, convicted one congressman. He was probably a scapegoat, and there's probably more involved. Still another scandal in the Grant administration was about the same time in the early 1870s, and it was known as the Whiskey Ring. And it was a conspiracy between distillers of whiskey and treasury officials to defraud the federal government of taxes on liquor. It was centered in St. Louis, and uh, the IRS officials paid local newspapers and even paid $30,000 in cash to the president's private secretary, all to keep the operation a secret. Grant never knew about the ring, but some of the money actually stolen was given to his re-election effort because the crooks wanted to uh, keep him in power, thinking that he was, uh, you know, he was clueless. 
Uh, in the end, some accountants found out about it, and in uh, 1875, several were convicted, but they only got light sentences. Perhaps the best example of a political boss, boss was William Marcy Tweed, who uh, sort of ran New York City from his, his headquarters in Tammany Hall, and he was kind of known as the Tammany Ring. But uh, Tweed controlled New York City finances when the city was really becoming a metropolis and it was growing and needed fire and water and all the other services and you know he sort of controlled the money at that time and he would buy off politicians and buy off judges and the politicians all worked for him uh, in the end he was uh, ultimately indicted but served only a brief period in in jail it's interesting to note that one of the people that brought the tweed ring to uh, public knowledge was the political cartoonist Thomas Nast, who was really kind of hounded him in his cartoons. But Nast is a, uh, notable because he was the first to depict a Republican as elephants, and he uh, popularized the Democrats as donkeys, and of course the donkeys and elephants uh, are what represent the two parties today. Uh, Nast also was uh, credited with uh, creating Uncle Sam. The Democrats tried to make political way of all this corruption, but the booming economy and the political power of the industrialists, always supporting laissez-faire, you know, kind of blocked them. There were a small number of Republican reformers known as mugwumps, or half-breeds, so named because it was said they couldn't decide if they supported business or reform. They sat on the fence with their mug on one side and their wump on the other. Uh, but the majority of Republicans were against reform. The majority of Republicans that were against reform are known as stalwarts, and they were led by the New York Senator Roscoe Conklin, who kept a pretty tight ship and kept all the, the votes in line. In the late 19th century, only three significant reform laws were passed, but none were really effective or adequately enforced. The first was the Pendleton Civil Service Act of 1883, which attempted to address the corruption and abuses of the spoils system. It established a formal civil service for most government workers, whereby a merit system guided promotion. It created a, a civil service exam to ensure that there's no political influence. The Pendleton Act helped, but it was, you know, wasn't enforced at the outset, and especially at the higher, more powerful levels, a system of political spoils remained. The second reform was the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887, grown from the uh, complaints of monopolistic prices in the railroad industry. The Interstate Commerce Act created an Interstate Commerce Commission of five members to oversee the railroad industry. It also required reasonable rates and in, uh, had investigations of unfair practices. The ICC wasn't that successful initially because a lot of its actions were declared unconstitutional by a conservative Supreme Court full of laissez-faire jurists appointed by the Republicans. Uh, for example, the ICC couldn't inspect the financial records of the railroad companies to prove uh, their case. The last significant reform was the Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890, an attempt to expand the money supply, thereby lowering interest rates and helping people who needed easier credit, like the poor people. Uh, with the money uh, based on gold, the law instructed the Treasury to buy at current market prices four and a half million ounces of silver monthly, which was about the output of the nation's silver mines every month. The law then required the government to issue treasury notes redeemable in gold or silver, equivalent to the, the cost of these purchases. The idea was to increase the money supply. Unfortunately, the silver prices fell in 1893, and afterwards the government paid uh, far less uh, in its monthly purchases, and you know they didn't issue as many treasury notes. As a result, it wasn't as effective as intended, and many reformers continued to press for more money in this system. This concludes a section on uh, corruption uh, in, the, in the Industrial Revolution.